welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday rundown of all things rockets, starship and space flight history. So, without further ado, let's just waste no more time in the intro and talk about the thing that we usually talk about first in these videos, and that is, aside from terrible unscripted ad-libbed intros, uh, talking about SpaceX's starship. Did I, was that a, was that a good like, intro? Or whatever, just roll the transition card. Work on the launch infrastructure for the orbital Starship flight, which SpaceX still hopes to execute over the next month or so, continues at breakneck speed. The launch integration tower, which will serve both as the catch mechanism for the massive super heavy first stage and as the crane that will complete the vehicle assembly process by stacking the Starship onto the super heavy booster, is now a defining feature of the Boca Chica skyline. The tower currently stands at seven segments tall, with the final eighth segment likely to be stacked very soon. To be honest guys, not a huge amount of changes have taken place since last week's episode as the Boca Chica coastline has had some pretty bad Bad weather with high winds and thunderstorms, which of course definitely puts the brakes on how quickly SpaceX can get stuff built. Of course, the launch tower and pad are only one half of the Starship development, the other half is, well, the Starship. <laughs> the Starship that will be making the upcoming historic orbital flight test will be the Starship SN20, which stands for Serial Number 20. Okay, okay, so we've been a little bit confused as to what the internal naming systems of the various starships and super heavies are for a while now, after Elon began referring to them as ships and boosters, rather than SNs and BNs, and Michael Baylor tweeted a full decoded breakdown of what the new naming system actually is. Starships, it seems, are now just known as ship, super heavies are booster, the whole serial number part of the name is out, so from now on in these videos I'll refer to the vehicles by SpaceX's new naming system. So, Ship 20. It's slowly coming together, we've seen components being fabricated with a whole wall of heat shield tiles covering the entire side of the vehicle, which of course will be necessary if the ship is to withstand the extreme speeds of re-entry up to Mach 25. Overall though, there aren't a lot of updates regarding SN20, oh, I said SN20, Ship 20 since last week's episode though. Booster 3, the colossal rocket stage that's currently out on test stand A, underwent ambient pressure test testing last week and has since had a Raptor engine fitted. From the looks of things, it did go up and down quite a few times on the scissor lift, so this may possibly be only for fit and installation testing, rather than being plumbed in for static fire testing, but who knows? My hope is that we'll at least see this rocket ship roar, even if it'll stay firmly on the ground. On the subject of Raptor engines, Elon posted this photo of some of the new arrivals at the Starbase site. Squint carefully and you can see a vacuum Raptor toward the back. Right now, Raptor production rate, compared with other engines in the world of rocket engineering, is very fast, but not fast enough for SpaceX. Elon confirmed that construction is beginning of a second Raptor production factory at the McGregor SpaceX test site, which will focus on upping the production rate to two to four engines per day, which is ludicrously fast. Two to four engines per day, assuming a seven day work schedule, means between 730 to 1460 per year, which is about the same range as the 800 to 1000 per year that Elon estimated would be required to build the Starship fleet that will be used to build the SpaceX self-sustaining Mars City. We're getting a bit ahead of ourselves though with talk of the Mars City. Elon estimates that that'll be done by about 2050 and a lot has got to happen before then. For starters, you know, there's the first Starship flight, my next Planet Coaster video, and completion of the launch facilities. Hopefully this week we'll see clearer skies and kinder weather, which means that more stuff can happen outdoors and in view of the cameras, so we can have lots to discuss on next Monday's episode. My hope is at the very least we should see the completion of the orbital launch integration tower with its eighth and final segment, though of course a lot of internal work will still need to be done before it's ready, and of course it's still not really known how it will be set up to catch the falling super heavy, if this tower will even be used for booster catching at all. Time will tell, but for now I'm leaving this week's Starship coverage there. So then, let's take a look at what else we saw last week. Last week's launch schedule began on the 6th of July when China launched a Long March 3CE carrying a Tianlian communication satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit. 
The success of this launch was followed by another Chinese rocket, this time a Long March 6, which on the 9th of July placed a Ningxia-1 Earth observation satellite into low Earth orbit, where it is now operating successfully. I think the most significant launch from last week, in my eye, was the suborbital flight of Spaceship 2, VSS Unity. This, of course, is Virgin Galactic's flagship tourism space plane, which can also double as an experimental platform for customers such as NASA, which took its very first space flight with not just the two pilots, David McKay and Michael Masucci, but also with a full crew of four, Sarisha Bandler, Colin Bennett, Beth Moses and Sir Richard Branson. And yes, Sir Rich the Mad Lad has done it! He's beaten Jeff Bezos to the punch, becoming the first billionaire to build a spacecraft and fly it into space. The flight went well, though the stream did run into a few hiccups, which meant we didn't really get much in the way of onboard camera angles during the flight, but we did get lots of exterior shots, and the onboard camera feeds did momentarily return during the descent, where Sir Richard offered some great words regarding the flight and his admiration toward the team behind the Virgin Galactic program. I'm sure that now the bird is back on the ground, we should get lots of footage recovered from its internal cameras, but since this flight has only just happened, that's not come through yet. At least for me, at the time of me writing the script for this video. <laughs> All eyes then now turn to Jeff Bezos. Jeff who? Jeff who? Who will be flying on his own new Shepard rocket to the edge of space on the 20th of July. He is hoping that this mission meets the same level of success that Virgin Galactics managed. Last week, NASA confirmed that another element has been added to the Space Launch System stack, the Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter. The rocket is really starting to look like the one we're used to seeing from the animations now. The only bits left to be added are the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the Orion stage adapter, and the Orion spacecraft itself. NASA have been publishing these great infographics on the stages of SLS development, which I think would make Brendan Lewis very proud. <laughs> Sticking to the theme of NASA projects, the Little Ingenuity helicopter made its ninth flight on Mars last week. On this flight, it flew a record of 625 meters at a blistering record speed of 5 meters per second. This flight was very high risk, as it pushed the navigation system to its limits, as its systems assume that the ground is flat, when in reality this particular landing zone was not. Luckily, the little helicopter touched down safely, and with this flight under its rotors, it has once again exceeded the distance travelled by its big brother, the Perseverance. Now that's all said and done, those were all of the major things I wanted to discuss that took place last week, so now let's take a look at all the launches we can expect to see this week, though First, you know, I gotta shamelessly ask you to like the video if you're finding the ride enjoyable so far. It really helps channels out. Anyway, onwards! Uh, yes, uh, this will be a short segment because there are no confirmed flights for this week. Well, we may see a Black Brand 9 sounding rocket launch a Dynamo 2 scientific payload to the edge of space from the Wallops flight facility anywhere from actually yesterday to the 20th of July. Man, it's really hard to follow the planned dates for suborbital flights compared to the orbital ones. Who knows, we may get a surprise flight from China this week. We do sometimes get only very minimal notifications of long march launches. And hey, perhaps Jeff might want to launch New Shepard a bit sooner in view of Richard Branson's success. Admittedly, this is an unlikely scenario, but yes, sorry, there isn't really much to discuss right now. Hopefully, we'll be rewarded with a nice busy launch schedule the week after this one. And with that, let us hastily transition from this short and clunky segment into our final one, all the most interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place this week. The first historic anniversary of the week takes place on the 12th of July, when in 2006 the Genesis 1 was launched. The Genesis 1 was an experimental space habitat module designed to serve as a platform to test various materials, systems and techniques related to evaluating how viable long-term inflatable space structures will be. 
The benefits of inflatable space modules are chiefly the lower launch mass and larger interior volume despite the smaller payload size. I guess you guys know how inflatable things work, right? <laughs> On board the Genesis were a number of monitoring systems and equipment as well as a life sciences experiment which contained four Madagascar hissing cockroaches and around 20 so-called Mexican jumping beans which are seeds containing the live larva of the Cydia saltitans moth really hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> the mission was only designed to last for six months, but the plucky spacecraft's avionics systems continued to operate for over two and a half years before eventually failing. Orbital decay was expected to occur in 2018, however, so far this hasn't happened, and so for now, the Genesis 1 remains in orbit. The next anniversary takes place on Wednesday, the 14th of July, when in 1965, the NASA probe Mariner 4 took the very first ever close-up photographs of another planet during its flyby of Mars. The photographs took approximately six hours to get beamed back to Earth, but what a payoff it must have been. I guess it's easy to take it for granted these days, what with NASA flying a literal helicopter on the red planet as we speak, but to actually see the planet up close for the first time must have been truly mind-blowing. Mariner 4's journey didn't even end after its Martian flyby. The probe then spent another three years in solar orbit, conducting long-term studies of the solar wind and making coordinated measurements with the Mariner 5 spacecraft. It remains drifting through space to this day, although communications have been over for quite some time now. It's funny, actually, that the Mariner 4 Martian flyby should be on the 14th of July because on the very same day, exactly 60 years later, NASA's New Horizons probe performed the first ever flyby of Pluto, giving us the first real images of the dwarf planet, upgrading us from this to these spectacular photographs. Perhaps I spoke too soon when reminiscing about what it must have been like for the Mariner 4 operators to receive the first images, since I remember the New Horizons probe photos vividly. On the 15th of July in 1975, we saw the launch of both a crewed Apollo spacecraft and a crewed Soyuz spacecraft on the first ever joint Soviet-United States mission. On this history-making mission, millions of people around the world watched on TV as the Apollo module docked with the Soyuz capsule. The crew of both ships opened up the Hatch linking the two vessels and shook hands as a symbol of peace between the two nations, and a moment that is widely considered to mark the end of the space race. It would also be the final ever launch of an Apollo spacecraft and a Saturn rocket, as the US closed down the Saturn program in favour of the space shuttle. Another big anniversary coming up on the 16th of July. On this day in 1969, Apollo 11 launched. This is a mission that you may have heard of. It was a Saturn V carrying astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins on the first ever manned mission to the surface of the moon. But you already knew that, didn't you? Do I really need to add anything else? The achievements of this mission were a landmark in human spaceflight, and it remains one of the most famous and important spaceflights ever. I hope the crew weren't deterred by something that happened earlier in the week, on the 13th of July, when the robotic Soviet lander Luna 15 failed to land on the moon successfully, instead crashing and disintegrating. At least we know that the crew of the Apollo 11 did not meet a similar fate. On the 18th of July, we have another launch featuring the previously mentioned Michael Collins, as well as astronaut John W. Young. This was in 1966 and was the launch of Gemini 10 from Cape Kennedy on a 70-hour mission that would include docking with an orbiting Agena target vehicle. The Gemini spacecraft docked with this successfully, and shortly afterward it cruised along to a derelict Agena with no remaining battery power left over from the aborted Gemini 8 mission, in order to prove the Gemini's ability to rendezvous with a passive object. As the second Agena had no electricity, the rendezvous was performed entirely by eye, without radar. Despite this trickiness, the rendezvous went well, and astronaut Michael Collins spacewalked over to the dormant Agena at the end of a 15-meter tether, making him the first person to meet another spacecraft in orbit. 70 hours after the launch, the Gemini capsule successfully splashed down in the ocean, and it's now on display at the Cosmosphere Space Museum in Kansas. The launch of Gemini 10 was the final anniversary I wanted to mention this week, which therefore brings an end to this week's history segment. <laughs>
And that's it for another episode of Space This Week. I do very much hope that you've enjoyed our discussion of government-funded space programs and the antics of three eccentric billionaires. And hopefully we'll have lots to talk about next week as more news unfolds about Starship, Blue Origin, and of course, the Virgin Galactic VSS Unity mission. If you were to go to space, what would you go on? The VSS Unity or the New Shepard capsule? Let me know in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed what you saw and subscribe so that you get notified of these videos when they go live and there is a little join button down there as well so you can become a member and get some custom emojis to spam in the comments and you get a badge next to your name or, or you could join my patreon there are patreon names on screen if it wasn't obvious i i feel like i should address that even though there is a big patreon title card when that starts scrolling so it's all a bit and now i've run out of time i didn't even talk about anything on screen but there's there's things there they are you can click them if you want <laughs>